Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Heavy Hats. I am your host, Connor. Rebush with me as always is Tom McKenzie. So, hello. Hello. UFC Fight Night, Holm versus Bueno Silva. Are you excited? I am so goddamn hyped. I'm just <laughs> looking down the list of these fights. Wow. We were just talking about uh, the uh, international fight weeks of years uh, of years before. And remembering that time when the lightweight title and the women's strawweight title were both contested as the main events of fight night cards one day apart from each other. We had Yinjecha Gedelia 2, an amazing fight with one of the best single moments of swagger you will ever see in a title fight. Dos Anjos Alvarez, the huge upset, those happened one day apart from each other. And then there was UFC 200 that weekend. And uh, we're like, the, the UFC is never going to top that again. But we were wrong. UFC 290 was good. But is it as good as a card which features no less than 38 fighters I've never heard of? <laughs> <laughs> No, we're talking about UFC 290, folks. Card of the year so far, as you said uh, before, Phil, no question about that. Competition is not stiff, but also, no denying, this was a phenomenal card. It was a banger. I mean, like, it, it was good on paper. It, well, another but, one of those ones where it just hits multiple different yeah. points. It's got like stupid stuff and awesome stuff nostalgia and dominance and back and forth and heartache let's not forget the heartache yeah yeah uh yeah i mean this was a this was a great card on paper we knew it was going to be good this is one that could have easily sort of underperformed and the results still would have been very interesting to talk about but no it overperformed Fights that could have been slightly violent were insanely violent all the fights that no one cared about were finished in like two minutes apiece and uh, and the main card was just incredible. I mean, basically the entire thing to the point where the the main event, as fascinating as it was, Volkanovski Rodriguez, basically by the time it rolled around, couldn't be anything but a disappointment. Um, just because, like, I was after the co-main event, an all-time great title fight between Moreno and Pantoja. I was exhausted. Like, the experience of watching this main card live, it made me think of when I was a much younger uh, MMA fan, and I watched the Strike Force card, which had the rubber match between Gilbert Melendez and Josh Thompson, which is a series I feel many younger fans probably won't be aware of, but was at the time a really epic uh, legendary series of fights between these two fighters. You should go and watch them if you haven't seen them. And, you know, good. it was a good main card. That fight was just exhausting. Huge swings of momentum, nonstop action, like it just built and built and built. And then I had to watch Josh Barnett, Daniel Cormier right after, which was also at the time a very interesting matchup. And... uh and it was a great fight and a really amazing performance by the still, you know, as yet kind of unproven DC. But I was just like too tired for it. I had seen too much yeah. in, in a span of two hours. And uh, in the same way, yeah, like uh, I almost felt bad for Volkanovsky because like this was a characteristically brilliant performance from him. Uh, he took what we all regarded as a, a very dangerous challenger and just uh, basically removed every way in which he could be dangerous and crushed him uh, en route to that. And uh, and it was just like, I've seen too much violence. Like, this is just a fight now. So, but hey. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think it was... It ended up being like a nice sort of somewhat relaxing... Sure. to the rest of the card like i was like oh because it was it was such a potentially stressful fight and yeah you know partly because i just wanted volkanovsky to win <laughs> and uh yeah the fact that he was just uh winning easily from the beginning <laughs> i was just like oh okay he's 
he's just doing it, isn't he? Yeah. He's just he's just that good. And you get a nice, like, smooth masterclass to to even things out, like the yeah. kind of post meal brandy. Uh yeah, right. I've I've had a I've had an eighteen ounce ribeye and a half a pound of creamed spinach and a gigantic steakhouse twice baked potato and a, a stuffed mushroom. Do I really want a fucking ice cream sundae <laughs> for dessert? Mm-hmm. You know, just a, a little a little butter cookie and a coffee will do. Thank you very yep. much. This is a soothing way to end this horrifically gigantic meal. Um yeah, I mean th- none of these are real complaints. It's um just how I was feeling at the time. Again, a characteristically impressive performance from Volkanovsky. He looked extremely well prepared. Uh, as we suspected, this was one of his most wrestling heavy performances. Like that was right there on the table, but it's still impressive given how difficult it is for the average fighter to make those kinds of sweeping adjustments to their games where they're just kind of a slightly different version of themselves every time. Now, Volkanovsky saw an advantage on the table, and he leaned into it um, and clearly tailored his entire approach to, I have to pressure this guy and take him down. I almost felt that it was going so smoothly at the start that he kind of took his eye off the ball in round yeah, three. Yeah, I think that's, that is almost exactly what kind of happened in the third round. Right. There was a long period of just him hanging out with Yair in neutral space. And then he just got clipped up a few times. Yeah. You could see he was just like, no. No, this will not happen. And then, and then he just pushed it up a gear and then crushed it. Yeah. It was almost like he got bored of just easily beating him. Um, yeah. well, it was like he was doing you know a bit of the GSP thing where he was like, I have beaten him so comprehensively right. on the ground, let's fight him on the feet for a while. Right. And then he was like, oh, this is actually uh, troubling. I'd better kill him. Yeah, and, and and I did love the um, the the sequence that put Yair down. I mean, first of all, we talked so much about Yair's uncrackable chin. Eh, Volkanovsky just landed a perfect shot on him and stunned him. Um, so that's impressive in its own right. But um, I wish I had uh, written down their name. Somebody on Twitter posted a little comparison clip of um, Volkanovsky landing this combination twice. This is a move he does quite a bit, but uh, he throws you know, his inside leg kick, which he loves. He probably mm. does that strike better than anyone in the sport. Uh, inside leg kick, and then he drops back into southpaw, which is a pretty common way to like quickly retreat after firing a kick. And as he drops back into southpaw, he's in position to kind of bring a right hook, a now lead right hook in after the kick, uh, which is sort of like a T.J. Dillashaw-esque move. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, like calmer, I think, and more accurate than uh, Dillashaw often was. And he literally lands that on Yair in like the first two minutes of the fight. Inside leg kick, Yair instinctively tries to fire back, suddenly finds that Volkanovsky has shifted backwards out of range and eats a right hook. And this is the exact same punch that, yeah, some eight or nine minutes later, uh, sends Yair reeling and allows Volkanovsky to finish him. So again, something he had prepared, something he picked up. We know Volkanovsky is a very adaptable fighter. We know he pays attention to the patterns in his opponents. And just another example there of him completely understanding how fighting works <laughs> in a way that few other fighters do. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if we said it as much as implied it, but the, I mean, the, for me at least, a lot of the questions around this fight weren't necessarily so much, you know, does Volkanovski win, even though it was obvious that, you know, Yair is incredibly dynamic and incredibly dangerous and certainly could win. Yeah. I think the, the highest bar for Volkanovski to clear was, could he beat Yair Rodriguez just essentially without taking any damage? Yeah. Because this is what no one had been able to do for a very long right. time. Right, they were all horrible, brutal fights, exactly. And, you know, this is particularly crucial, as I said, because Volk is getting old. 
he's getting up there, you know. Mm -hmm. You do not want to be having fights where you're up against some young, hyper-violent, super durable guy who is just, you know, taking chunks out of you the whole time. Uh, but instead, you know, he he did basically just clear the highest bar possible. It was, you know, yep. reminiscent of, like, uh, for me, like, GSP Alves. Yeah. Um, going way back. Yeah. Which is one where, you know, you just people just thought about how incredibly violent Tiago Alves was, how he'd already proven that he could, you know, stop uh, Matt Hughes' takedowns. A massive low kicker, uh, and you know it was it was just hard to imagine a way that GSP would win that fight without it being you know brutal war. And mm -hmm. people didn't still re didn't you know trust GSP to kind of be able to win that kind of fight. But it just wasn't. He just dominated him. Yep. And this was just one of those those fights. People do not dominate Jai Rodriguez like this, or at least they haven't done for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I I love the GSP comparison in particular because. Uh, I thought GSP was the best fighter of all time, <laughs> you know, like for ages. Like, I think maybe by the end of his career, Aldo had maybe slightly edged him for me huh. um, with all of these incredible past prime performances that he was putting on. Uh, something that GSP, you know, he managed one, basically. But really, it was like GSP's prime ended and he was out, which was, you know, good for GSP. But I, I always thought GSP's resume was so incredibly stacked and so diverse and his performances were so perfect that like clearly he was the best fighter I'd ever seen. And Volkanovsky is the second coming of GSP. He is that kind of fighter. Huh? Except that I think he's grittier than GSP. I mean, I think he, he is, you know, he's not the greatest fighter I've ever seen. He is the best fighter I've ever seen. Yeah. I think. No, I think so too. Yeah. MMA. We've said this like I said, after the, after the second Max fight, I've never seen yeah. the third Max fight. I've never seen all time great dismantle another all time great like that. Not exactly. really. Yeah. After their and... second fight, I was like, oh, Volkanovsky's number one pound for pound and Max is two. It's obvious. And then their mm -hmm. third fight, it looked like number one pound for pound versus some guy. Um, so yeah, he's just, he's just the best. I know there's going to be at least one person in like the comments, like being like, Oh, they're sucking off Volkanovsky again. Like just embrace it. Like you are, you are witnessing an all time great fighter just doing it again and again. Like how, why can't you appreciate that? Look at what he's doing, man. Look what Yair did to Max Holloway. Do you have no respect for Max Holloway as a fighter? Forget what Volkanovsky did to him in their third fight. Yair gave another all-time great fighter a miserably tough fight. He huh? had to fight tooth and nail the entire way, even though he won. Way harder than, like, Calvin Cater, who everybody loves and respects with reason. And, then and honestly, like I said, uh, from a stylistic perspective, I would expect Max to be tougher. Or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, given how... They've both developed as a championship fighter, as championship fighters, just because Volkanovski is shorter than Holloway, uh, and more to the point, his game is mostly sort of built around outside fainting and you know, chaining together one or two or three strikes, but you know, never the sort of Holloway-esque avalanche. Uh, if you were thinking of someone who's rubbish on the back foot but is immensely dangerous in mid-range... Um, Max Holloway is far more likely, you would think, to be able to just start putting them under pressure and then keep them under pressure for the rest of the fight until they've right. lost. Right. He just he just wasn't. It was just they just fought back the whole time. Uh, just never let Max get comfortable. Max did go to his own takedowns. Couldn't control them as well as as Volk did. Um, and yeah, this was just like this was just pure domination. <clears throat> yeah. And um, frankly, it looked like Yair's fight with Frankie Edgar from years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's part of it. Like, Volk is just a better wrestler than Max Holloway. Um, but uh, again, like, that's not how he's been beating everyone. That's not the thing he's been, like, tailoring his game around these last few years. And um, I don't know that he's 
you know, you don't you don't look at Volkanovski and think like, oh, this guy's like an incredible takedown artist, or this guy's an incredible control grappler. Like, no, I mean, you to go back to grappling oriented Volkanovski performances, you basically right. have to go back to before his championship run, right? And there and there is a large element of use it or lose it in yeah. combat sports. He hasn't been using it. Um, he didn't like uh, venture to control Brian Ortega a great deal, for example, and a lot of their grappling came from Ortega creating scrambles. He tried to take Max down, but couldn't control him or take him down with great success. Like it's not something he's had a lot of practice at in his fights. And yeah, he just, again, clearly in his camp worked for this to recognize this as his great advantage. And then turned out he's still a sharp and clever enough striker that when, uh, as we said, he kind of seemed to just sort of, like take his eye off the ball. Um, maybe wanted to like feel Yair out since he'd comprehensively beaten him on the ground and find out what he had to offer on the feet. And then he was able to adjust to that adequately and finish Yair starting from the feet. So you can't say enough good things about their performance. Um, and there really aren't any bad things to say. So I, <laughs> I think we should kind of wrap it up and get on to the co-main event which, uh, as I said before, was just a far crazier fight. Um, so, yeah, anything else to add on Volkanovski-Rodriguez before we take a break? Um, yeah, I mean, just that it's one of those things where, like, as mentioned, Vol- I think last week, Volkanovski is one of those guys where he has at least three ways of fighting available to him. He's very good at all of them. You know, he's going to... And... On the off chance that you might be able to compete with him in one of those areas, there's probably, or even two, there's probably a third one that he's going to be very threatening in, and that you're probably not going to be able to deal with. So, for example, you know, this was him just flawlessly bringing back the wrestling and takedown game, which, you know, again, like we said, uh, watching him out-wrestle Islam Makachev at the end of their fight, you're just like, oh yes, that's how he beats Yaya Rodriguez. But yeah, he's yeah. A, he can out-wrestle people. Uh, he can outbox them, and he can also just be a range. He can also just be like a a crafty range kicker. And yeah, I mean, I think it's just hard to find anyone in the featherweight division that you could think could really pose a threat to that. Because you know, Elia Tapuria might be next. He looks great. Uh, looks like a fantastic fighter. Would I expect Volkanovski to use the gear that he hasn't used that much for these last couple fights and simply low kick him to death? Yes, kind of would. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he's just like I said, best. He's just the best fighter I've ever seen in MMA. Yeah, this this is again, this is how GSP used to beat people, <laughs> namely however he wanted, mm-hmm. however was best, and he would mold himself to that. And then at a certain point, just start beating them in the other places he hadn't, he hadn't banked on so heavily. Um, yeah. So you, you can't do better than comparisons to GSP, in my opinion. And, um, yeah, Volkanovsky, he's the best. All right. Let's take a break. When we come back, the flyweight title was also on the line at UFC 290. Alessandra Pantoja versus Brandon Moreno. Two slash three, and uh, we are going to have a good time talking about all the chaos that went down in that one after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. All right. Welcome back to Heavy Hands. Uh, as I said, we we're talking about Pantoja Moreno, or rather, as it was billed, Moreno Pantoja 2. Um, really the third fight between these men, but as everyone knows by now, their first fight was uh, technically an exhibition uh, contested on The Ultimate Fighter. Second fight, 
sort of cemented what the style matchup was. And this, as we guessed, was an interesting test of the style matchups don't change theory because uh, clearly it was a, a massively evolved version of Brandon Moreno. And the fight played out very differently because he has straight punches and an actual boxing game now. As we said, his, his boxing has improved so much, he literally did not have those skills in their last fight. And yet, he could not stop from having a brawl with Alessandro Pantoja. And that is the style of matchup between these two men. No matter how much Brandon has improved, how much more capable he was of navigating that brawl, the fight was still insane, just as their last one was. And um, that meant for an extremely entertaining and uh, honestly one of the most competitive and like tightly contested five round title fights I can recall seeing. Yeah. Where, you know what I mean? Like where it wasn't even like clear momentum shifts the whole time where it was 50 50. A lot of these rounds, we'll talk a little bit about the scoring, but I will just say up front, um, like I kind of totally understand why the scoring was so all over the place, both among the, oh, actual, yeah, for sure. the actual judges and the fans, because I watching it live. I don't know how you score some of these rounds. Uh, I, 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 I have my feelings and my personal preferences. Um, I was talking with Kyle about this on Twitter and he disagrees. You know, he, he's Kyle's the man who created monsters like Ryan Wagner. Um, who, you know, they, they have their opinions and then they're like, this is it. Anyone disagrees with me, it's just wrong, <laughs> and that's it. And I'm actually not being subjective. I'm actually correct. Um, where Kyle was like, this, I was like, well, you know, there's a lot of room in the scorecards for personal preference here. And Kyle's like, no, there's no personal preference whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, you know, like, it, it, you know, the, the, the scoring criteria just aren't objective. Like, it's not entirely clear how you're supposed to weight grappling against striking. You have attempts to finish, but effective grappling that involves attempts to finish does not necessarily yield anything material in terms of damage. And so do you just wipe grappling off the chart uh, completely? Or does it does it have to be considered with slightly different sort of parameters than striking where damage is king and i try to kind of straddle that fence i think grappling having such different goals and different uh, parameters for success needs to be weighted a little differently or evaluated a little differently that being said if a round is like round five of this fight almost perfectly 50 50 striking and grappling and one guy wins the striking and therefore delivers more damage, and then the other guy wins the grappling but doesn't get anywhere, I'm going to go with the guy who won the striking. And so I thought round five was a Moreno round. I scored this fight 3-2 Moreno. But many, many what? people... I didn't really think that round was... I thought that round was pretty closely contested on the feet. It was pretty close. Yeah. No, yeah. Pantoja no, that's the thing. That, that's what well. makes uh, that's what makes that round, I think, difficult to score. In the like, this is why I see it. I I am not shocked yeah. at all that people can't agree on this fight. These rounds were these guys are just insanely competitive, like huh? super razor close the entire way for five rounds. Like there are very few clear rounds in this fight. Maybe the I think first. It's, you know, it's round one. It's round one, Pantoja. Yeah. And round two, Moreno? And round two, Moreno, yeah. That's basically that's it. it. Everything else is just chaos. Mm. Yeah, but it's also like... When I look at it statistically, I'm like... Just at the end of the fight, it's like, you know, Lawler Condit. First time I watched that one, I was like, oh, I think Robbie Lawler won. Then when you look at it in the end, you're like, man! Yeah. <laughs> Carlos Condit landed a lot more strikes than him. And... Yeah, in, in general, I just find myself thinking, like, the striking exchanges were not super one-sided. And also, Pantoja racked up, like, literally minutes of control time in this fight. Yeah, like, that's the thing. It, uh, it, like, at the end, you look at it, and you just, I did find myself thinking, Pantoja probably should have won this fight based on what he has done. Like, Daniel has not really separated himself out uh, 
enough uh, to beat out like just long stretches of uncontested control time. Because yeah, most of the time on the feet was just was just like super close. Like I thought Moreno was just about edging him out most of the time. Yep. Um, but even then, like you know, just Pantoja would just come back and land some giant bomb, which would just make me think, okay, I still think Moreno won that exchange, but not by much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pantoja was not getting crushed on the feet. And whether or not you think Brandon was getting crushed on the ground depends on how heavily you regard attempts to finish, because he definitely got controlled a lot, but not much really happened other than that. Yeah, but, but there it was, was certainly a stuff lot that of he it. definitely really didn't want to happen to him. Absolutely. Yeah. It was very, you know, you know, every time he got back mounted, he wasn't thinking like, "You're right." Oh, this is going to be a neutral position. All my striking stuff is going to yeah. won me this round. No one is ever thinking that. Everyone, when they get back mounted, is thinking, "Holy fucking shit, I screwed up." <laughs> yeah, like, especially when it's Pantoja. Need to get out. <laughs> when it's Pantoja on your back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But then again, Brandon also orchestrated some amazing scrambles on the ground too. Or Pantoja would get to his back. There there was one where, I think it was maybe in round three, Pantoja got his back, and Moreno had to, like, uh, he he had to kind of, he got his shoulders to the mat and, like, half spun out, and then he had to very carefully, like, wedge his hand up under Pantoja's armpit so that he couldn't attack the arm that was hanging as he was trying to Mm -hmm. spin, so he didn't give up the arm bar in the transition, like daring daring scrambles that needed to happen or else moreno was gonna lose this fight a lot more clearly than he ultimately did um yeah i i just i i have a feeling i like clean strikes and while i weight grappling more heavily than some who only care about damage i do favor damage above all and so I scored this fight moreno but i really can't be mad at the actual scorecards or any reasonably close cards delivered by fans. Like, I think 3-2 mm-hmm. in either direction, and weirdly enough, there's somehow, depending on how you score fights, there's somehow a case for 4-1 in either direction, too. Like, it, it's... It was it was unbelievably competitive. And, and nearly 50-50 in all three of the last three rounds. Um... So, yeah, unbelievable. And can I just say, I'm very, very happy for Alexandre Pantoja. I'm I'm a big fan of Brandon Moreno. The guy delivers nothing but amazing fights, really. Um, even if uh, oftentimes that's a result of him making some sort of, you know, glaring strategic mistakes. Nobody, some people are out there like constantly disappointed in Brandon Moreno. No one's knocking Chucky Olives for making strategic errors, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Give the kid a fucking break. His fights are amazing. Um, yeah, he doesn't fight perfectly. That's why they're fun. Cause he's, he's a madman. Uh, and he wants to scrap and you gotta love that in a, in a champion. But, um, I mean, the amount of incredible fights he is now, like, uh, unbelievable racked up is, it's, yeah, remarkable. Yeah. Even his fights that are more forgettable, like that, that, First fight with Kai Car of France. No one's talking about that as an all time great fight. Go back and watch that shit. It's a great fight. Um, but I'm very happy for Alexandre Pantoja because, uh, this guy does not get the respect he deserves. The UFC just doesn't give a fuck about flyweights in general. He was. A, 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 a yet another story of this kind of which the UFC should be forever ashamed he was talking about how he was like working for uber eats until just before like his last fight to provide for his family because that's how much a like perennial top contender at a ufc division is actually making to do his job and uh and i also thought his post-fight interview was like one of the most moving i've ever seen he um he gave all due respect to Brandon Moreno, which I like. These guys deliver horrifically violent, insane fights, but they have nothing but love for each other. Those are the best kinds of series when fighters form that kind of bond. Um, 
And he got up there and he said, you know, uh, if you knew my story, you wouldn't boo me. Uh, my mom raised me and my two brothers alone. And he said, are you proud of me now, dad? That and, uh, like broke my heart. I'm, I'm, I can't even joke about that. Like this was such an emotional moment for this guy who has been guaranteed excitement in like every single one of his fights and has fought the best the division has to offer for ages now. And now he's a champion. So I can't be anything but happy and moved for him. And I, I hope it leads to some kind of sustainable financial success. I have little hope of that, unfortunately, but I, I would love to see him get set for some time because of this. Uh, he certainly deserves it. Yeah, I mean, this was exactly the kind of fight that, you know, the, the brave Brazilians of the divisions get yeah. and then often don't win. Yeah. It's just that he was he's getting on for it as a flyaway. I'm not sure what he's like. How many years into his UFC career? I mean, to his MMA career, 15, 16, something ridiculous like that? Something like that. Let's see. He's 33, just quite old for a flyweight. Yeah. He debuted as a pro in 2007. Here we go. 16, 16 years. Yeah, he's 16 years in. And to come out there and give that kind of... You know, Endless blood and guts performance. Uh, you know, as you said, like after getting no money for pretty much his entire MMA career. Yeah. Um. Yeah, just like uh, claim the belt when people didn't think he could. Yeah, I couldn't be happier for Alexandre Pantosha. Like as I said, you know, this would be the one I would be happiest to be wrong about when we were picking these when we were picking these fights. And yeah, I mean, you just don't expect people to be able to put out that kind of performance at that point in their career. Yep. Even if you thought like elements of the style match were still there, which they they were to an extent. Mm -hmm. You know, just to you know touch on the tele technical elements. That I guess that's what we're here for. For sure. Um, Let's get into it. The in, uh, the basic dynamic in the first fight, which is that uh, Pantoja can just punch his way into the clinch. Uh, this was one hundred percent there. Yep. Um, uh, Moreno was still willing to be, uh, still willing to just try and grapple with him rather than disengage. And it just meant that Pantoja could just wade through fire getting there. I mean, it was, it was simply much more costly for him to do it yeah. too, than it was before. He, he, instead of punching his way into the clinches, a lot of the times he got punched his way into the clinch, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> but he still, when Moreno hung out trying to extend combinations, a lot of the successful takedowns came from Pantosha just eating a shot and then grabbing a hold of Brandon and yanking him off his feet. Uh, but on the other hand, he did also... It, the thing that he did that I wasn't necessarily expecting was that he just jabbed with Moreno a ton. Mm -hmm. This is what we kind of kept saying that Davis and Figueredo should do and he just didn't do after their first fight. Yeah. Uh... You know, just stick that ramrod jab out there. Uh, and Pantoja did it, and he just stuck to it, man. Yeah. Uh, again, it's not the, like, diverse jabber that Brandon Moreno is, and it didn't, he didn't necessarily win all those exchanges. But it's not a, you know, as we've said so many times, it's not a question of necessarily winning in every area. It's a question of ensuring that you are competing in a given area Absolutely. rather than giving up on it. Yeah. It so kept, were, kept him I mean, the there were up. times when, he, yeah, there were times when he would win the jab exchanges or when Rayner would be looking to do one of his, you know, his combinations where he'd like, you know, go double jab and then left hook to the body and then left hook upstairs or, you know, something like that. And because Pantoja had been tapping his own way in behind the jab, is that he could just counter Moreno out of his slip. You know, he he wasn't he hadn't thrown himself out of position or he wasn't throwing his, his guard up at that point. He could just see Moreno slip and just, you know, punch him in the head. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, literally, the uh, the knockdown that won Pantoja the first round was a jab. Hmm? It was uh, Moreno jabbing, and I think he was one of those things where he he'd stepped in with a jab and he got caught clean on the chin. Obviously, Pantoja has a power jab. 
Um, but it also caught him right at that moment when he picked up his back foot to like reset his range. It's one of those where his leg just buckled. It was just a flash knockdown because he, he couldn't absorb it. Um, and probably hadn't fully warmed into the fight yet. But yeah, the Pantoja being willing, uh, and capable of jabbing with Moreno literally won him one of the only clear rounds in the fight. And otherwise it, it just kept him in the running the entire time because, um, a 50 50 punching exchange, even a like 60 40 one in Moreno's favor, strategically, that's fine for Pantoja's game. If he can mm-hmm. take the shots, he hits harder than Moreno. And, um, yeah, I think we, I think we tried to cover this, but like the thing with Pantoja is he's not like a great technician, but he's certainly not a bad, uh, boxing technician either. Like he has the basic elements that really work for his physical abilities. Um, you know, and I, and I loved it because it meant that both guys got to shine in the exchanges in this fight. That like Pantoja's willingness to stay in range, um, and just kind of stick his jab out there and then cover up and then fire back with these catch and pitch counters that, that showed off his, his, um, his solid basics and his, that instinctive counter punching that we talked about. It also meant that Moreno got to have like a really basic canvas to work with for some of his most beautiful combinations. You have a guy who would jab in and he could slip and come back with a left hook to the body that landed because Pantoja's guard is very high. And then a left hook up to the head and that comes with a pivot that gets him out of the way of one of those instinctive trigger counters. Um, we just got a million exchanges. And so both guys got to demonstrate why they are so thrilling to see Tangle with people on the feet. And then a lot of those exchanges worked out for Pantoja even when he lost them, even if he ran into like an elbow or a forearm shiver because um, he was able to just connect with Moreno and overpower him and drag him to the ground. Um, so it was, it, was, it was really important that Pantoja continue to be willing to, to force those exchanges because they led yeah. to the areas of the fight where he was dominating. Yeah, that, that is really what comes out of it the most, like as the most impressive part of it to me, is just that he could keep doing that. Yeah. That he could just keep, you know, taking damage at kind of that age, at that stage in his career. That is almost always the point at which people are just like, no, I don't want to do it anymore. At some point, you can do that when you're super young. You can just soak up damage, keep coming, and... You'd never have a thought for your immortality kind of thing. Mm-hmm. This, you know, it was his first five round fight because obviously the UFC treats the flyweights like shit. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he just he just kept refusing. And you know, the commentary team was talking about how gassed he was. Yep, he kept just refusing to give up and refusing to stop going. Yep, he's got a great style for gassing too. He was definitely running out of steam, as I kind mm. of suspected he might. But we didn't really address it because Pantoja is one of these fighters who uh, never seems to get quite tired enough to be out of the fight. Like, you can see it affecting him. His reactions get a little slower. But his style works for being gassed because he's, like, flat-footed as hell. <laughs> he just either lets shots bounce off his forehead or he just catches them on a very basic guard. And he just slugs his own punches back in there, and he's got naturally heavy hands. He is not a fighter whose power... Um, is totally dependent on like snap and speed. He is a thudding puncher by flyweight standards, and so yeah, you just couldn't you just couldn't actually tire him out enough to have him out of the fight. Five straight rounds of war, absolute war. Yeah, insane. Um, um, yeah, I just don't know who he fights next. Yeah, right. I mean, Figueredo's done. Moreno again? Figueredo's done. I mean, I, yeah, just do yeah. Moreno again. I don't care. I mean, the UFC needs a stronger flyweight division. Uh, they have been picking up a lot of flyweights, a lot of, as we've noted, like weird ones who don't really seem like flyweights. But, like, uh, I don't give a shit. Like, if you got nothing else going, let Moreno have the second incredible four-fight series of his career. 
Are we really complaining about Moreno Figueredo? How jaded are we that we're like, oh, I wish I hadn't seen those fights. They were unbelievable. So whatever. Yeah. These two deliver incredible fights too. If you've got nothing else, I mean, who else is there? There's, um, Balbazi basically, and maybe Roy Val, yeah. who Pantoja has already beaten. Are you, are you desperate to see Amir Albazi fight? I mean, I get if you if they go for that, fine. I'm not going to complain. I think it's basically uh that is whether that happens is dependent on whether they have a uh like Abu Dhabi card they need filling. Pretty much. Yeah, cuz I've that, already I think been it's probably Moreno. I've already been hearing whispers that basically uh Chucky Olives is probably not going to get the next fight with Makachev because like uh whoever the hell wealthy magnate runs uh, Abu Dhabi have like insisted on having Makachev on their card. And, right. and Chucky has said that he's not going to be available by that date. So, <laughs> you know what? Pantoja Makachev. <laughs> he might be able to pull it off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if they do all Bazi, um, sure. I mean, if they put that as like a co-headliner to a Makachev fight, I'd be happy with that. But if they're not going to do that, if they want, or if they want to give al one more fight to develop, which I think he could use, whatever. Do Moreno Pantoja again. These guys are unbelievable together. And yeah. uh, I mean, it was it was mildly horrifying the amount of damage that they took. But you know, yeah, it's fighting. You know, what are, <laughs> yeah, they they just seem to be able to do that. And that's they seem to like it. Yeah, that's the mildly horrifying part about being a fan of fights in general. And. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's not like we're watching two prospects get ruined here. These are two guys at the top of their game. I think they like fighting each other. I mean, Moreno, I'm sure he was crestfallen, but he didn't even seem that mad at the end. He was like congratulatory. I think they, I think he likes fighting Pantoja. It's like a. Yeah, this is like, you know, it's after the Figueredo fight. He wasn't. Exactly. Yeah. It, Moreno likes to test himself and have these crazy fights. And, and so does Pantoja or else he wouldn't be doing it for the fucking peanuts he's been getting paid. He either likes it or he needs it. Um, and one way or the other, uh, I would be happy to see these guys have uh, another fight. How could you not be? The fight was... It, it, I mean, for pure action, it is it is the fight of the year so far. No question. No question whatsoever. Yeah. Five rounds of absolute chaos. Um, so closely contested. I mean, just like, like Moreno Figueredo, even, I mean, more consistently than Moreno Figueredo, I think these guys are a perfect matchup. Uh, they have, they haven't even had like one weirdly disappointing fight between them. They've all been insane. So, uh, yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Huge congratulations to Alessandro Pantoja. Uh, I think he, he definitely earned some fans with this performance and he deserves that and a lot more. As I said, a, a reliably thrilling fighter never disappoints. And, um, yeah, just very happy to see him, uh, get to wear the belt. And I hope, I, I hope he keeps it. Even though I love Brandon Moreno, love watching him fight. Pantoja wins a, f- a potential fourth fight between these guys. I'd be very happy for him all the same. Uh, speaking of being very happy, that's it for joy. <laughs> because next we have no, it to, isn't. <laughs> next we have to talk about Phil's worst nightmare coming to life after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. You can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. Phil, last weekend, you you said to me you had a terrible sort of vision, a premonition, one might say at this point, of, you know, not watching the card live because you're not dedicated enough to uh, get up at 5 a.m. or whatever time it is to watch a UFC pay-per-view in the UK. No, that's disgusting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and you had this this dream 
this 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 haunting feeling of sort of logging on, not really looking for spoilers, but just sort of accidentally having your eye come across something mentioning, you know, how impressive Drakus Duplessis was, or how sad somebody was for Robert Whittaker, and just see, seeing basically enough of a hint that you couldn't help but put it together for yourself. Hmm? That. That the worst had happened. That Drikus Duplessis had defeated one of our all-time favorite fighters, Bobby Knuckles. And I would like you to predict that I will win the lottery because <laughs> <laughs> you, your powers are stronger than I ever imagined. And you willed this premonition into reality. And I'm mad at you for this, but please, could you do something nice for me next? Oh, that's not how it works. It's just curses. <laughs> All I can do is curses. I'm entirely <laughs> negative. Yeah, so I have I basically didn't get to watch this fight until later. I have a group chat with some friends who know not to spoil UFC fights for me unless they have specifically asked me, have you seen the fights? And I say yes. Mm -hmm. One of my friends was instead, he was just like, Man, Drikus Duplessis seems like a great guy. Is he okay, Phil? I hope he isn't a sex pest. And I was like, oh, fair enough. Uh, I don't I know guess. if he's a sex pest, I guess... but there's some other things going on there. Yeah. I was like, uh, duh. Also, I was like, oh, yeah, he's not going to be asking these questions about someone who just got, you know, yeah. unceremoniously KO'd, is he? Yeah. Oh, you ask these questions about someone who has been talking because they have won. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, God. Oh, no. Because it's won. Yep. It happened. It happened. Um, and you and I kind of differ on how we thought this fight was playing out. There are a lot of different yeah. perspectives. I mean, obviously, people are reeling trying to make sense of this because nobody saw this coming. Certainly not us. Uh, but nobody, everybody was shocked. Uh, except Drikus, I suppose. Yeah. Drikus and, like, Drikus's parents, I guess. Yeah, his parents and, like, one of the other three, like, South African reprobates that he's always talking up. Um, didn't one of the other ones fight on this card, actually? Uh, it's a possibility. Is it Kamuela Kirk? Is that his guy? Who lost? I think so. Maybe? No, no, it's Cameron Simon, sorry. Yeah. And he won. So South Africa, South Africa, South, South Africa, oh, oh, I can't do the accent. Uh, Rain it wasn't bad. South. <laughs> I mean, as far as Connor accents go, no, that doesn't mean you get to try again. Okay, this is Drikas greeting It'll his win. parents when he gets home. Hello? <laughs> Oh, I know how much you love that one, Phil. Mm. <laughs> it's exactly the same as the Australian, for sure. Yeah, well, that was, uh, that was, that was the joke. Yeah, so... <laughs> that was but the basically, joke. I, I, the basic thing about this was that I knew that Drikus had probably won this fight before I watched it. So this allowed me to look at it thinking, is Drikus Duplessis going to look any better? Like, yeah. You know, have I have I dramatically underestimated this meme fighter? Maybe oxygenated Drikus is really good. Um, you know, what's the what's the difference going to be? I know. Like, I'm sorry. Like, no, I've seen people saying I watched the fight and I was just like, oh yeah, uh, he landed like a silly takedown and then he landed like one punch and it managed to rock Robert Whittaker really badly and just that was it. It was like. This has happened several times with Robert Whittaker against people that he's better than, be they Darren Till or Jared Cannonier or whatever. Mm -hmm. they, they've managed to hurt him, and this time they managed to finish him, and Drika still looks really bad. <laughs> I'm not changing my opinion on him at all, apart from the fact to say that like he's a better top position grappler than I thought he was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and there we don't particularly disagree. I mean, I, I thought in some very small ways, like... um. Like in, in what I saw from like Irena Aldana before the Nunes fight, where I was like, yeah, she's sort of figured some things out. 
you know, like Macy Barber, you know, I'm like, eh, okay, you know, like she's been doing this long enough. Maybe a couple of these decisions are better. Uh, basically, I thought Drakus' technique still looked like absolute dog shit. He ca- he knows no huh? other way. These are his fundamentals. Um, it, it did make me realize how challenging that might be in a way I probably should have considered beforehand but didn't for a guy like Robert Whitaker who expects his opponents to be doing things that make sense and trying to sort of get a bead on Drakus's like rhythm is he's a very awkward guy to fight and you would think that making like five preparatory movements in a row just to throw a kick like somebody on Twitter pointed out how every time he throws a kick he literally does like a little jog beforehand every time <laughs> And it's true, but somehow you put one telegraph is bad, but like eight telegraphs in a row is sort of like a tricky sequence of feints. It's like, what is he doing? Um, But I did think I thought he looked more patient than he has in past fights. I think a lot of that came down to the fact that he was fighting Robert Whitaker rather than, say, Derek Brunson, who just invited him to have the stupidest fight of all time. And he was all too happy to oblige. And, and I, but I did think that he also looked quite um, aware defensively by Drake's standards. Uh, and again, I think Robert gave him some unwitting help here. Uh, all I'll say is that Drake's kept his guard up. And he knew when Robert was going to be punching back at him. He wasn't super counterable compared to some previous fights. But again, another thing we probably should have picked up on beforehand uh, and didn't really highlight is that Bobby Knuckles really is a headhunter? Yeah, I saw Luke Thomas was doing a, a little piece about this as well. Did he? It was like, yeah, yeah. He was like, uh, Drake has picked up on the fact that Bobby Knuckles is a headhunter and uh, a headhunter and sporadic low kicker. Uh, he blocked all of his shots and so on and so forth. I would hesitate to give Drake too much credit for that. <laughs> Picking up on yeah, it. I, don't, I mean, no, it's, it, it is Drake. Like, you got to, you do have to say, like, Drikas is a student of the game. Like he, you know, he once again he did his Drikas thing after the fight of just being like, yeah, to, just uh, two two minutes and thirty eight seconds, this exact yeah. thing happened, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah like he looking remember? like a like a drunk guy fighting in flip flops <laughs> and then coming out afterwards <laughs> and being like, actually, we wanted to uh, exploit his problems with the southpaw double tick, and you're just like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. You ever watched yourself? Some deeply closeted uh, man having a drunken brawl at the pier at Muscle Beach, and then just explaining to you, yeah, like why he did this particular move uh, after the I first didn't. seven and a half exchanges. Well, how do you know that? Everything you did could yeah, not I, I mean, be on I'm, purpose. I'm, and they talked, you know, quite. He did apparently talk quite a bit about the, the, you know, he studied Whitaker's issues with this against Southpaws and so on, and. Well, hey, yeah, I mean, and you know, I'm sure they probably picked up on the fact that he's a headhunter as well. He's a he's a student of the game, like, but he's just like it's true. Just he's just not good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, fair enough. Um, but I I did just watching the fight. Uh, I put this more down to a mistake on Robert's part more than something that Driguez had deliberately looked at and exploited. But you're right. There's no reason to think he didn't notice this. It's an identifiable thing in Bobby's game that he he's a headhunter. Um, you know, like I, I can probably if I think back, I can probably count the number of times I've seen him throw a good body shot on like two hands at most. Mm. Like even uh, body. He doesn't even throw body kicks. No, exactly. He, he, the head kick is his move. Um, I've seen him throw a jab or a left hook to the body, and it's always nice when he does it. It always looks good, but a few times. He, he, he is a headhunter. And this really worked in Drakus' favor, however much he planned for it, because he was ready. He had his guard up. And an awful lot of Bobby's shots just, just bounced off his forearms. Uh, cause he knew he was ready for that. And I, I said this while the fight was going on. I was like, Robert needs to adjust because Drakus is so obviously defending his head. His elbows are like at his chin. Just hit him in the body. It's completely wide open, and Robert couldn't pick up on that. So that is both a credit to Drakus for being apparently aware um, and being, you know, 
whatever the case, being ready to defend his to defend his head. And it is a criticism of Robert that he could not adjust and could not even think of hitting the body at all. He just headhunted the entire time. Um, so yeah, that's something. The other thing is, uh, that, then that's basically it. Like, that's all I see in terms of Drigas' improvements. He blocked shots uh-huh. to the head with pretty good success, and he was a little more patient. He didn't, like, just run after Robert the entire time. He had a pretty reasonably paced, uh, like, range kickboxing fight. And then the other thing yeah. that just shocked me was that, um, there was no athletic golf at all. Like, Drigas uh-huh. reads as slow because he's incredibly awkward. But he will hit some really surprising flashes of speed, throwing his hands and things like that, which clearly caught Robert off guard at multiple points. And then in terms of physical strength, he, he out-wrestled Robert Whitaker more successfully than Yoel Romero did with a head and arm throw. A head yep. and arm throw. Good, good, good thing for Daniel. Not even like a super good one. <laughs> no, no, a sloppy one. Be, a lot of it was him just, again, falling sideways. Yeah, a sloppy one. He didn't even like elevate the foot. He just sort of like, he sort of just stuck his leg behind Bobby's and just kind of sat on him. And Robert's like, mm-hmm. oh, fuck, and just got crushed to the ground. Thank God for Daniel Cormier's sake that Dominic Cruz was not there <laughs> to ask him to explain <laughs> that takedown. Because he had to be screaming internally when that happened. But it, it's because Drikus is a, he's a fucking ox. That's the only thing I can think of that made things like that work. And then when he got on top of Robert, I don't think he's like an incredible technical grappler he doesn't seem incredible anywhere technically but he does have a style of grappling that really works for his physical strengths he hit some nice passes on bobby on the ground mostly yeah like strong guy passes just like smashing through his legs and stacking him and just driving his way through but man that works because he's just like he's just like a a horse he's so powerful uh, that he literally looked like he looked bigger than Robert too, like significantly. Yeah, shorter but bigger. Just much thicker, and on the ground he just looked way stronger. Like Robert just could not make any positional advancements at all. Um, so th- that's where I disagree with you on the just sort of yeah, like one takedown and one punch. I thought overall, um, a Drakus made a couple of small but meaningful improvements and b um i thought that uh i I did think that i I don't know do you did you think robert whitaker looked off at all a lot of people were saying that i can't i just thought it it just looked like it just looked the same i was just like oh yeah he's winning this pretty easily gonna lose it at some point but uh I, i also thought he looked fine for the first round until that takedown and then i did think he looked worse after that I thought he looked like he had experienced something he didn't like. Maybe, but, you know, I still just thought he was... Even though a lot of his shots were getting blocked, they weren't getting blocked particularly cleanly. That kind of thing's happened to him before. Um, And then he just, yeah, he just got hit by one jab and he got stunned and that was it. And... I'm just hesitant to just be... to just think that Drikus is anything... More than I, I still don't. I genuinely don't think he's much more than a silly meme fighter with no, some I, physical gifts. I tend to agree, but it is a, a as as always when this happens, a useful reminder that um, you don't have to be more than a silly meme fighter to actually be functionally good. Yeah. Also, like sometimes just stuff happens. Sure. Sometimes, sometimes you're right. Oh, just spinning back kicks. Uh, gay god Musassi. Sure people have a big giant fight about whether that's a fluke or not yeah no that only a fucking idiot would do that but um but yeah like just being like a a hoss who like does stuff who just tries like being a fighter defined by effort more than anything else and having a couple good ideas to go along with that that that's like enough the uh, physicality is king man like 
This was one of my first realizations when I started analyzing fights. And somehow I have yet to fully internalize it. I still keep getting surprised when somebody wins a fight because they're just like a beast. And I'm like, the, everything they do sucks. They're like so untechnical and yada, yada, yada. And like, that is only a part of the game. And it's just like this. And yeah, it's just that this kind of stuff happens. Like I said, like Darren Till knocked. Yeah. Whisker down in their, like the first round of their fight. And Darren Till actually uh, sucks. Like functionally as yeah. well as not, yeah. not being a good fighter intellectually. Like Jared, Jared Cannoneer. Like badly hurt him at the end of their fight. Like, yep. And, yeah, it's like, whisker has been fighting these guys for a while. At some point, the dice were just gonna, you know, just gonna come up snake eyes. Yep. And they did. Just happened to be against three, because I am not particularly, I gotta say, compelled by his, him fighting Adesanya. A, because Adesanya oh is just going to try his it is is basically the main question is going to be like can Adesanya get a stinker out of Drikas Duplessis like he can almost everyone else? Yeah, probably. Although I don't, I, I would love to think that that uh, Drikas, with good reason, pisses Adesanya off enough that he actually wants to destroy him. But um, yeah, we'll see. I still have not watched whatever the interaction was between them in the cage. Oh you? no, no, I, I saw there was something. Uh, like Adesanya was like saying something about like it's my African brother, and like just kept saying something like that, and then I, I just I started cringing, and then I put it off. Yeah, and like I don't know, like one, one or both of them were like saying the N word at each other or something. I don't know. And what? Like, oh no! I don't know. I mean, I I I I don't want to say anything definitive because I don't I don't know. I did not watch it, and I have honestly been too afraid to watch it because. I like, I, the fight happened. I was in shock. I went and like refilled my drink. I came back to the desk. My headphones were off and I just saw them in the cage and I waited a uh. solid 10 seconds without putting the headphones back on until it was done. Cause I was like, this looks terrible. This looks really embarrassing and uncomfortable and I don't want to experience this. So I don't know. When it, when it rolls around, I will have uh, had no choice but to watch it when their fight rolls around. But uh, I'm just going to wait until then to actually <laughs> subject myself to that <laughs> discomfort. Yeah, I'll pass. Thanks. <laughs> Who was it? Hectic one on uh, on Twitter had a fun meme where he was like, uh, he did a Don Draper meme about the UFC's marketing department. He was like, the UFC marketing for uh, Adesanya Duplessis. It's, uh, it's uh, Covington Usman, but with but international and with even darker racial undertones. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Um, so yeah, not looking forward to that one. <laughs> so yeah, but anyway, Hey, drink is Duplessis. He is the best bad fighter in the world. And there is no question about that. The one. Yeah, but he's not good. Don't be fooled. <laughs> he's not good. <laughs> you don't have to be good to be good. But he is not good, okay? Do not forget that. All right. Well, uh, that has to do it for this week's episode of Heavy Hands. Uh, there are a couple more fights to talk about. Phil, do you want to talk about some of these undercard fights with me? Let's do it. All right. We're going to cram in a little bonus episode for you right after this. So make sure you head over to patreon.com slash heavy hands. As for the main episode, that's it. Find us on Twitter at Evil Greg Jackson at Boxing Bush. Those are the two of us. You can figure out which is which if you don't know already. And uh, next week, God knows what we're talking about, but uh, we're going to talk about it. And we hope you'll join us for that. Until then, if you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. <laughs>